Um, let's go ahead and read the word of God and let's, and let's see what it says. And you. So remember that, that Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, it's all about what God did in Christ, right? So while God is working this great power, while God is working these, this great power, and you, the, Ephesian, the Ephesians, were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead. Doesn't sound like a lot of choices going on right there. You're dead in your trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Period. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had predestined, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, <laughs> Wow. Let's go ahead and let's investigate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead. And I'm, going to, I'm going to break out some of these things so that we, we can uh, work through this. So just bear with me right here. If you notice how I'm breaking this out, I'm, I'm breaking out dependent clauses. And as they are subordinate to each other, that helps us to see relationships. I hope that you can see what I'm doing here. So I'm looking at big ideas and then dependent ideas. Let's go ahead and let's look here. Okay. I hope that everyone, so I'm all of, all of the, as it goes to the left, as it's bracketing to the, to the, to, I guess the right, I hope I'm getting that right. I'm always confused because it's mirroring and everything, but as it's indented, those are dependent ideas. Okay. And so uh, just to remind us, let me, let me remind us about So in the previous context, God is working his power in Christ. This is what God is doing. Okay, and so while God is doing that, we have this conjunction here. This conjunction is, is, is connecting back up to the previous sentence. So, so while God is doing this work, okay, and this really gets at, at pride and arrogance of, of humanity, right? While God is doing this great power, who is the you? Let's ask that first question. Who is the you? We, yeah, so we, yeah, okay, we. so it, okay, so the application, we're going to get to it later, it's, it's us, it's us, the, the, the church, but we could, we could say this is the, let's, let's just stay in original context first, Ephesian believers, right, this is the Ephesian, the Ephesian, the Ephesian saints, using language of Paul, Ephes, Ephesian saints, right, while God was doing this incredible work in Christ, the Ephesian saints, so this here, this is a state. What kind of state were they in? <laughs> what kind of state were they in? Dead. Never yes. Dead. So let's talk about this. If if you're if you're dead, what does this mean? If you're dead, uh, you don't know what you are doing. So no sense, nothing. You're, th there's the inability to act, right? or to do, right? Okay. Now, now, what else does death from, from Voss, from Voss, looking in the Old Testament, what else does death symbolize? 
What else does death symbolize? Separation to God, from God. Separation from God. Let's do, uh, let's do this under curse, right? So if you're dead, you're under God's curse. You're not, you're not under the blessing of God, right? So those are three fundamental ideas of what this dead conveys, okay? And, and, and then this, is, this, goes to what, this goes to what Ray just said. In what realm are you living in being dead? What, what realm are you living in? And the realm, that, the realm or the sphere that they're in is this, this idea of trespasses and sin. Trespasses and sin. So this is the sphere in which they are dead. So is, is everyone tracking there with me? And so inability to act or do, this would be in, 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 a, in, a, in a moral, in a moral God-pleasing sense. Because obviously we're going to see that they can act, right? We're going to see that they actually act a lot, <laughs> right? We're going to see that. We're going to see that they're actually very good at acting. So they're dead in their trespasses and sins. So to what extent are they in this, in this state, right? To what extent? Let's ask the question here. Full extent. Yeah, I like that. To the fullest extent. Because, because Paul could have just said, you are dead, but God in his love, right? He could just ended it there. You were dead in trespasses and sin, moments of weakness, right? You have moments of weakness. <laughs> but look at this. He's going to belabor the point. So uh, in which the which is connecting back to sins and trespasses. So this is a description here. You once walked. If you're describing life as walking, is this, is this a one-time act or is this more than that? What's another way of describing this type of, of action? Conduct, your conduct of life. I like that. Conduct, or we could say lifestyle. So this is not... Trust passes of sin, moments of weakness, one or two times. I, we're, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. We just, you know, I mess up sometimes. No, you, you, your, your, your lifestyle is that of a, so let's, let's, get, let's get practical here. So we would say sinful, sinful lifestyle. That's their behavior, okay? Number one. So we can, we can get here. This is a, how can we define dead? To what extent dead in trespass and sin? Number one, sinful lifestyle. Now look here. We've got two according to statements. Now, some of your translations will have according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. ESV is using following, which is a good, which is a good uh, 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 translation as well. And so their lifestyle is number one, following the course of the. So this is this is following the the stand. Let's put standard here. So this sinful lifestyle is following the standard of the world. It's the world's lifestyle. Let's write this down. World's lifestyle. And if ever you were to wonder about this and say, who is behind the world's lifestyle? This is an explicit text that you can use when you're debating with people or when you're struggling when you see stuff going on from, 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 from media, from Hollywood, all the, me the media going on, all the, the behavior and activity, the, the physical and the outward is coming from something more fundamental. The one that's working behind it is the prince of the power of the air. So who, who is this? Who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan. Obviously, this is Satan. And, and, and his kingdom, right? The kingdom of darkness. But the whole LGBT movement, all of these things that are these, the, new, the, new, the new hottest things in the world, you can't just look at it as being physical and just coming from people. Behind it is the work of Satan. And this is, this is where, this is their state. This is the state that describes, not only are they dead, but in fact, they are not choosing God. They're actually walking according to the world's standards, and they're following within Satan's kingdom. 
And then this gets to, to, to root issues, okay? Who is this spirit? Is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So this is internal, internal. Now at work. So while God is working to raise Christ and raise him above every authority, which would include this. So, 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 so look at this here. Notice here too that Christ from our previous context, Christ is above this authority. Right, this is, this is 1, 20 to 23. The spirit that is now at work in sons of disobedience. So if we're ever playing games where we don't think things are at work, God is at work, Satan is at work, and we're in the middle. But we're not we're engaged prior to our conversion. We're not doing the work of God. We're not doing the work of God. Satan is at work behind the scenes. And we're fools if we don't, if we don't see this reality, okay? So uh, while God is doing his incredible work in Christ, this is what's going on, and it's not done. So look, we still have a whole other verse. <laughs> we have a whole other verse for describing. This is all under description. So I hope everyone sees that. This is the most lengthiest description. Blessed be the God, Father of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's what God is doing. <laughs> We are following Satan. We're following his world. The, the, look at this. It's going to get worse, though. Among whom? So, sons of disobedience. Among whom? Among whom? We all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So, this is association. So, let's, let's put in a sidebar here. So, number one, we could say that we are dead number two we're following world and satan number three we are sons of disobedience do we view ourselves as that someone who cannot accept this they're not ready to choose christ we have to come, we have to come to self-awareness through the power of the Spirit that this describes us. This is not a pretty sight. This is very offensive. And this is coming back to the question about free will and our state and being able to choose, right? We're, we are literally dealing with that topic here. So uh, we all, we all once lived. So now we're including, we're including Paul and saints in this category, right? Without exemption. We all once lived, so that, that's the language that's coming up. That's our activity. What's another word for passions? Can anyone, maybe you have a Bible program up. What's another word for passions? Desire, I like that. That's a good word. Anyone else? Rusting, raving. Lust. Yeah, I like those two words. We are lusting. We are living following the lust of our flesh. So does that look like a choice? Have we made our choice? Yeah, it's a choice, Tim. It's one choice. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but this is where, this is where we're, we're splitting hairs because we are all given free will, okay? But look at the choice that, we're, that, that Paul has said we've all made. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So that's why, that's why it's kind of a, you're confusing the issue. Because when you talk about free will, everyone's been given free will. But what are you actually choosing? And so when, when, when you hear maybe of reformed theologians, of people talking about man not having a choice, it's because they're talking in the sense of this sense that you've chosen. <laughs> Everyone chooses the flesh. Is everyone tracking there with me? So it's not an issue of free will. It's an issue of what has actually happened. And all of us have, have, have chosen, according to Paul, this is in the text. You can't get out. 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And so let's be really clear what this means. This is the sphere. And notice, not the spirit. Uh, We're in, not, go ahead, yeah. In since we once lived, we once lived under the power of Satan. So yes. we have no choice but obedience to who rules over us. So can we say we are innocent on that? No. Or yeah, we have no choice. Let's say we have no choice because we live in that sphere, uh, that, that sphere or that, yeah. that, that, that kingdom where Satan is our ruler. So ours is just obey because there is no choice. Yeah. So let me ask a, a question. The, the, the family, the, the son who, who grows up in the mob family, grows up in the mob family, and that's all he's ever known. He's been taught how to carry out the business of the family, right? Godfather, right? All the sons, Fredo, everyone else. No doubt they were led, they were following their father's, their father's wishes, but are they still accountable to the law? Uh, yes, they're accountable because yeah. we were created not that way. So, so this is why in one sense, yes, we're in Adam. And so, and so how is this fair? But at the end of the day, the reality is, is that God created us and, and it was Adam's stewardship that fell. And so it's hard for us to imagine being in a corporate setting where the ruler, we face the effects from, from our ruler, from the corporate head. But, but that's, that, that is the way the world has been set up. And so that's um, a hard truth to accept. We're, we're still accountable for that behavior. And the text is going to tell us that we're accountable of it. This is something to think about. God is just in judging sinners. And many times we think that's in, in uh, injustice because, oh, how is that fair? But the law doesn't look at fairness. The law looks at, has it been violated? Oh boy, come in here and, and if, if you want to jump in here. The, the law doesn't look at what's your past context. It doesn't look at fairness. It looks purely at if, if the law has been violated, there must be guilt and then there must be punishment. Diba? Go ahead. Go ahead. Jump that, in. Yeah, that's the reason. That's the reason the, the symbol for justice is a lady with uh, the eyes covered. Have you, have you noticed why the eyes of the lady justice is covered with, with cloth? So, so he will not, she will not see who is on the left side, who is on the right side. There's a balance. He's trying to balance. So he's not going to see. She's not going to see who is on the left side, who is, going, who is on the right side. That's the essence of justice. That's why I said you cannot be biased. You cannot be, you cannot, you cannot be on one side uh, to be just. You have to be fair. You have to be in between uh, to be to be fair. That is how it is to be fair. Excellent. That is a great piggyback. Thank you. I'm so glad you're in the class. And so it, it's a hard truth. It's a hard truth, Henry. But that's the reality. That's the reality. And so many times what we're looking at is not justice, injustice. We're, we, we, we desire mercy. So, so mercy is something else. Mercy and grace is something else beyond justice. Justice must be carried out. And, and we see that it, that it will be. Great questions. And if that's a hard thing for, for us to accept, for you to accept, this is not me saying. This is what the word of God is saying. And your struggle is with the word. So I want to push away from myself. I want to push away from, from what Kuya Bulboy said. It's not Kuya Bulboy, it's not me, it's what the text says. And we have to wrestle with that. And at the end of the day, the wrestling is, is how we view God, because this is the way, uh, what true justice think, is. Go ahead. Yeah. Tim, I think that the question usually comes up because the, the idea of God's justice is not what is found in this earth, or at least on, on, uh, among, among men. While, while God is espousing justice, the, the the, the one should be punished, those who sin should be punished. Sometimes it is not so in the in the in this world. 
Yeah. We see some some people who are guilty but not in jail. We see some people yeah. who are cheating but they keep on uh, having more wealth and more money and, yeah. and say, see, why are they like... That is the kind of justice that we see in this world. And sometimes yeah. to, to those who do not believe or has question about this, is there really a God? Why is he allowing this to happen? Yeah. See, that's, that's, that's where the question came from. No, that's true. That's true. That's one set of questions that we have to wrestle with. And then the other set of questions is what Henry was saying, like, how is this fair? Because there are people that are just caught. They're caught in, 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 in the snare of Satan. And how is that? How is that fair? And so looking purely from a justice perspective, it has. It's purely from the perspective of you're breaking God's law. And so for God to be just, there must be punishment. Yeah, yes, sir, because another argument sir, towards the injustice, um, they are using uh, this argument towards the injustice of God is the idea that how could we blame with the sin of uh, first of, of Adam and Eve, where in fact we're not there. So that they're the one committed the, the sin, why we are to, should be to be blamed of that uh, uh, kind of uh, sin. So that's the another argument uh, with regards to that kind of uh, uh, idea about the injustice that's yeah they're uh, always on yeah no and, and and so in one sense in one sense looking at that and, and we can say how is that fair and and again I, I would probably my response would be how is it fair that anyone would be in heaven then right because looking at what happened to Adam do you think you would have done differently so that's so so the one question is is would anyone else pass the test if it wasn't Adam. And so Adam is not only the one, the federal head that fell, but the reality is that all of us, all of us would have done what Adam did. For, for, yeah, for, so, yeah. So you're saying today, if Adam did not commit that, there's for us as we human being, we have a tendency to commit that the same mistake. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. okay. Otherwise that's the supreme arrogance saying that if, if I was in Adam's shoes, I would not have sinned. I would have been the perfect man. And so, of course, Adam was our representative that fell. But the reality is that not only is he our representative, he is typical. He is the typical man that describes all men. And all of us would have fallen. And for us to say, well, no, I wouldn't have fallen. That's the supreme point of arrogance. You've fallen in your pride. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> true, so, true. so I think a lot of this stuff really struggle. We struggle with wrestling with this because in one sense, it does seem unfair. Um, but this comes back to the issue of man-centered versus God-centered. Man-centered versus God-centered. Paul brought up in Romans 5, all, all, of, all of sin being trans, transferred to all of mankind is a hard thing to accept, but it was just. What's even more maybe unjust is that from one righteous man many were made righteous <laughs> so, so that's even more crazy right so this is where god's grace is greater as bad as it as the the apparent view that that all men, men fell in adam the greater grace that far exceeds that is that one innocent man sinned and then made everyone corrupt one righteous man brings all of those people from corruption into righteousness. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a further distance. Let me just draw this out here. It's a further distance to go so that we keep, keep our perspective, okay? So you have, let's say this is positive morality. This is minus, okay? You have one man that falls, and this leads to a, a nation in sin, right? So one man's sin leads to, 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 many, to many sins, right? Try this. One cross brings many sinners righteous. Do you see how this is a, this is the bigger, this is the bigger grace. This is the bigger act. Do you see that? Does everyone see that there? Look at the distance that's traveled. One man's sin leads to many sin. One man's Righteous act leads to many 
that are righteous. That's, that's what's more amazing. So it, it shouldn't be shocking that through one man's sin, many became sin. Although if we're focused on ourselves, it's unfair. But the greater thing is that God still saved many of us. That's the greater thing. So this is, this is coming from Romans 5, 12 to 21. Look at that at another time. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Let's go on here. Let's, let's finish up here. We're still on verse three. This is crazy. We're going to take a break shortly. So um, let's finish verse three and then we're going to take a break. Look at this though. We're not done. We're not done describing our behavior. Okay. They are carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. They are carrying out the desires. So what, what were we doing? Not only were we living in the passions of our, the desires of our flesh, we were, we were acting. This, is, this word is act, doing. We were doing the desires of our body and mind. This is not innocent people. And maybe this is where it comes back to. This is not innocent people who are just caught and not wanting to do what's right. These are people engaged in terrible behavior and enjoying it. They are engaged in terrible behavior and doing it. This is the condition of man. And no type of reasoning, no type of work is going to change that. God could come, Christ could come back right now and offer salvation. And people would not choose it. They, they, are, they are focused on carrying out their own desires. Okay. Now look at this. So this is the first action here. We lived in the passions of their flesh. And then number two, we were by nature. This is the nature of reference here. By nature, we were what? Children of wrath. So wrath focus, this word focuses on God's response to sin. Right, So we could also say children of disobedience. We could also say focused on passion. So let's come back up here. So we're dead. We're sons of disobedience. We're following the, the course of the world. We are also children of wrath. Children of wrath. Lastly here, and if ever you wondered, this is just for one or two people, not all of us are that bad. Okay, we're not like the Ephesians. They had a lot of gods they worshiped in Athens, you know, in, in, in Asia Minor. No, look at this. Just like all of mankind. So this is all humanity. Romans 3, 10 to 19. So... Before we take a break, what I want us to see here is that we can wrestle with, is this fair? How is this fair? We can, we can, you know, maybe I don't think it's fair. The text is, this is what the text is saying, that this is the condition of mankind, that we are not innocent. We are following Satan. We are giving God the double birds. We're giving him the finger. We're living our own, in our own desires, following our own body, our own minds. We are children of wrath. And we're in a state of dead, deadness. And every one of us would have done just like Adam. Although now we're in Adam, all of us would have fallen. No one would, could have passed the test. Only one man could pass the test, and that was Jesus Christ. And so, you know what's, you know what's unfair? God putting all of our sins on him, uniting us with him, and making us righteous. That's more unfair than anyone saying that we are in Adam. We're committing the same type of sins, worse sins than Adam. How is that fair? If you're going to claim that's unfair, what's even more unfair is God making anyone righteous in Christ. And so what I submit to you is that that's a very man-centered view of anthropology. And the reality is, is this is our condition. So two fundamental passages that describe the condition of mankind. The two most fundamental passages, theology, when you're talking about the, the condition of mankind, when you're talking about um, uh, free will, when you're talking about our status, Romans, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 319, we highlighted 310 to 19 there, and then Ephesians 
Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, two of the most fundamental in all of scripture. Write it down for the condition of mankind. All right, cool. Okay, let's get back in the text. So now we're on to verse number four. So verses one to three can be described as our description, the description of us while God is working. Okay, so uh, thinking about how you would preach this, right? Verses one to three could be a first major point, right? How would you preach this? Just something to be thinking about here, okay? All right, so let's look now at verse number four. So while, so while, while we are following Satan, children of wrath, dead in our sins, look at who God is. We have God. He's the actor here. Look at his state. So this is the state. This is uh, the state or description of God. So this is what I'm talking about. How is this fair? So we're, we're sinning against God. We're giving him the finger. We're committing sexual immorality, terrible behavior, rebellious, stealing. All of us have different vices, right? So while, while we are following Satan's power, God is rich in mercy. So we could say, uh, maybe, what is he rich in? So maybe this is, this is the object here, the objects of, of God's wealth. God is rich in mercy, right? God is rich in mercy. And look at the reason. Look at the reason for this. The reason for this is the great love with which he loved us. And what kind of love is this, anyone? It is an agape love. Okay, yes, no, that's great. So, so agape. Yes, agape. This is a sacrificial love. But thinking about the categories, what was the fundamental category that we said we had in, in the great benediction? What was that fundamental category? Unconditional. Yeah, it's unconditional, but so what's that relationship? How can we quantify that? Were we not adopted as sons and daughters? That's the kind of love that God has for us. Because even people can have sacrificial love, but there is a kind of sacrificial love that is infinitely giving, right? I, you know, you could give sacrificially to, the, to your church, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a, a love for the people in the church like you have for your children, right? This here, brothers and sisters, this here is the kind of love that God has for us sonship he loves us as he loves us as sons and daughters he loves us as sons and daughters let's move on here and if and if and if we forgot and if we forgot <laughs> paul just wants to remind us this is the time time state Right, so this is the state here. Paul wants to remind us. No, you guys, God has all this love for you. You're, you're, you're still in this dead. So look at this, brothers and sisters. You're not, you're not reaching out in this. Does everyone understand that? You're not, you're not reaching out in this. So at this point, when, when, when God made us alive together with Christ, we were not yet having faith. Do you understand that? While, while we were dead, while, while, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We tend to think of God's love. We tend to think of election. We tend to think of union with Christ. All happening, all happening at our conversion. This is our state. The sphere. Look at God's act. Look at God's act to us. While we were dead, while you were dead, God made us alive together with Christ. Look here, no, no reference at this point to faith. 
again, I'm not saying that we don't cling in faith to Christ, that, that we have to exercise faith. We have to be in union with Christ in order to be saved. But looking before that event, by grace, by grace, you have been saved. This is the action. Who is the actor here? Who is the actor? Uh, Jesus. Okay. Uh, God, 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 the yeah. Father. God. God the Father. So we can say, Tim, even Paul emphasized on predestination. God has predestined to send his son for us. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, before creation, yes. Before creation, God has already prepared his son for us. So we cannot say, uh, God, you are in justice because he first did justice for us. Yeah. yeah. God is, God, you can't say God is unjust because God's justice, anyone who commits sin, like, like going back to, to Bull Boy's analogy, Justice is blind. Anyone who commits sin, the punishment must be given. That's it. You, you, you can say, oh, that's unfair, and maybe you feel that it, that's unfair. But looking purely at justice, God is just in punishing sinners. What, what is unbelievable grace is that God, while we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive. He picked us up while we're, giving, while we're flipping him the bird. We're giving God the bird. We're giving him double barrels. We're, 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 we're giving him the middle finger. We're cursing his name. We're doing our own thing. And you'll say, that, you, you, you'll say Tim, well, I never really cursed God or gave him the finger. If you're, if you're worshiping your own passions, you're giving him the finger. If you're doing your own thing and not giving him the glory for every day that you live, you are giving him the finger. Because when you give someone the finger, you're saying, I'm in control. I do what I want to do. You take a hike. That's what it means. And maybe that's a grotesque way of describing it, but that's what we do. That's our behavior. When we, when we choose other things that we set our affections on before the creator of the universe, we owe our breath, our life, every single thing we owe to him. It's only by his grace that we're not consumed. And so here, here it is. God is acting for us with Christ. And so here we see we see this union with Christ. Now, I don't normally mention Greek, but in Greek, uh, the, the verb, the verb is, uh, you, you don't really have it expressed here. You don't really have it expressed here in English, made us alive together with Christ. The verb literally has with attached to it. So when God made Christ alive, Let's, let's be clear here. This is coming back to Christ's resurrection. This is coming back to Christ's resurrection. People will talk about this being spiritual life, and, and, and there is truth there. But fundamentally, when this union occurs, when God makes us alive, okay, it, this, is, this is describing the resurrection event. Right, so Paul says, I, I die, I, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. There is this union with Christ, inseparable. It's like a marriage relationship, the head, the body. And so when God made Christ alive, all those that were in union with him, incredible assurance, I'm getting goosebumps right now, incredible assurance, on the cross, he made all of us alive with him. This is what it's referring to. This is the work of, of, of God on the cross. And of course, by implication, when, when we have faith, we also are made spiritually alive. And so people will say that's the reference here. I think it's back on the cross, the cross event, because the, 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 the verb, it's literally made alive together. Like it's, it's if, if that makes sense, it's, he can't make us alive apart from Christ. I don't know if that's making sense to you. Um, and then you also have the, you also have the, the um, so this is how redundant it is. Let me, let me look here. So let me try to 
write this out so that you can, so that we can see how redundant this is. If I'm writing this in English, it's just going to be a little literal, okay? This is all one word. Ma made alive with. Made alive with. That's literally how the Greek reads. With Christ. So it's, a, it's double redundant. God made a, us alive together with Christ. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's as close as you can get. And what I'm saying here is that this happened on at the resurrection of Christ. Look at this. Raised us up with him. Again, this doesn't really encapture the, the word. Because in chapter one, it's just he was raised up. Just the standard Greek word for raised up. In this context, again, you have the with attached here at the front of the Greek word. So it's raised us up with him. And so that's how this is given here. But it doesn't really do it justice. So not only were we made alive with Christ, we were raised up with him. And then look at this here. Look at this here. Seated. <laughs> with seated. With seated. In, in the heavenly places. In Christ. So look, let's go back to, let's go back to 15. 15 questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, in this particular verse, what it tells us that, uh, how does, uh, how, how do you put that? Uh, we are, we are here and yet we're seated with Christ. Yeah. Is that what, what, this is what the text is telling us, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. in what sense? Spiritually? We're seated there, our spirit is seated there, or what? It's just a status. Well, so, what? Well, gr great question. So, let's go back to that, right, in a second. Okay, what I first want to see is literally when he raised Christ from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly place. Does everyone see that it's lit? So, so Ephesians 2, uh, was it five? F 5, is literally quoting these exact phrases but describing us now. Does everyone see that? So it's as close as you can get. So what I want to say is that, I, of course, there's implication in our spiritual life. But what I'm trying to get at is this is describing in the resurrection, exaltation, and seating of Christ, that happened to us, the saints. Is everyone tracking there with me? And so then, the appropriate question that Ray asks is how can that be, right? How can that be? And so the question is, is it just a status? We're not physically there. And so what I'm trying to get at is, that, is this, is that we are in close union with Christ so that when he sits down at the right hand of the, of the Father, what this passage is saying is it is as if we are there ourselves in Christ. Is everyone tracking there with me? Because of our close relationship with him. Does that make sense, Ray? Clearly it's symbolical in what, some sense, right? Or in terms of symbolic, but at the same time, it's, it's how you would put it. Like, it's really the status that you have there. It's you're seated there symbolically, yeah. but in the same time, it's, it's really your... Yeah, yeah, the status would get. But but so it's, it, so it, but it's more than symbolic because what what type of a, can we exercise this authority now? Do we cast out demons? Do we have the yeah. power and authority to cast out demons? Okay, what, we are. I mean, yeah, good. What I mean, it's symbolically it sounds like that, but in 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 actuality, you are really since you are in union with Christ, yeah. you are, you are really there as if I mean though you are here, but yet. Yeah. spiritually you are already there with christ together with him in the mind of god you are already there in the mind of god yeah, yeah, yeah. so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter even if we're physically here yes sir uh i same dilemma with uh pastor ray uh is this uh verse six? Oh no yeah verse six in, in uh still as with with him is it the already or the not yet yeah, so this would be, so this would be, okay, so let's, 
let's um <laughs> let us take a pause here and let me let me give you a diagram of what the already not yet describes okay and so it would be the already in the sense that we are already reigning but not yet in our fullness okay so let's do a quick let's let, let's look at a diagram of what the already looks like okay oh someone said like an ambassador yeah no that's that's good that's that's a good analogy but it still doesn't Union with Christ, we're, we're, we're more than ambassadors. In union with Christ, we will reign with him. So it's, it's, it's a partnership. It's, it's, it's closer than an ambassador, okay? Um, there's one sense, and of course, we're underneath and we're ambassadors. Paul is an ambassador. But I guess what I'm trying to say is in this specific analogy of being raised, we're, we're not, it's not ambassador in that sense because we have power just like Christ. Does that, does that make sense? It's more, it's a closer relationship than an ambassador. And maybe this will, this will come back to what Koyo Boy always says, that all of our analogies are deficient because there isn't really one that encapsulates what, what, what I'm looking at. Okay, let's, let's just look here first really quick here. Okay, so already not yet. Okay, so prior to the coming of Christ, the eschatological expectation was this. You had the old age. You had the old age here. Okay. And then uh, the Messiah was going to come. He was going to, the day of the Lord would be there. All of the enemies would be judged. And then the new age would usher in the, the messianic age, the eternal state. So we could look at, uh, we could also look here, we could define this as uh, eternal state. Sir, sir Tim, this yeah, old ahead. age referred to the Old Testament. Um, yeah, so this Not would really. be this would be the, the old age of the world. Let's just say the world. I don't want to use just Old Testament. Of course, yeah, I guess in one sense it is this would be the, the, the world. Prior to the final judgment, the final resurrection, it would all be ushered in the day of the Lord, judgment, resurrection, everything, and then you have the eternal state. Okay, that, that was the traditional expectation, okay? Of what would happen well christ came and it wasn't really like that and so the already not yet is trying to describe we're in the reign of the messiah we're in the eternal kingdom of god but it hasn't there's been a delay okay and so this is the this is the this is the already not yet okay and so the already describes could we know what's the reason of the delay, sir? Is there a reason for a delay? So that the fullness of the Gentiles who will be saved will take place. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, at the end of the day, Christ set it up that way, right? So Christ went to the heavens, and he it's not until the consummation when he returns. And so that's that's the that was the the mystery that was revealed that we had not that no one had anticipated. They thought everything would be over. But yeah, part of that was to bring in the Gentiles. That, and that's what Paul actually says in, in Romans 11. Great, great point, Ray. And then this is the not yet. So whenever you see, you'll typically see salvation is we have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved from the wrath to come. So there is the already is those things that are already true of us now, even though we're still in this age because there's an overlap here, all right? And then the not yet is those distant future, those distant events that have yet to be fulfilled. Is everyone tracking there with me? Is, is everyone on the same page with me? Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so just, just a brief definition here. This is the eschatological construct that explains how eternal events and benefits are now in the present without the end occurring yet. So this is the structure. There's an overlap between the two, okay? And so this makes perfect sense. So coming back to here, this is this is answering Jesus's question. This is our, this is this is already this is already this here is the not yet. The purpose is that in the coming ages. He might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So here we have a purpose for why he's done this. 
The purpose is so that he might show, or we could say he might reveal. He might reveal. And how can we define immeasurable riches of his grace? How can we define this? Anyone want to take a crack at it? What does this look like? Inheritance, right? We need to be thinking in sonship categories. This immeasurable riches is, is, is uh, inheritance. And if we look at inheritance, how do we define the inheritance? What are we going to receive? We receive all the benefits, the rewards, the earnings, yeah. the everything. All things. We will inherit all things. If God is the father, the ruler of the universe, and we are his sons, we inherit all his things. And we talked about this back in, 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 um, in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. And so here, the measurable riches of his grace, this inheritance. And we can also describe this. The way he's going to do this is in kindness. He is going to be a gentle, incredible father toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, how many times have we seen this word in Christ Jesus? This has come up so many times. In our, in our verses, it's, there's about four. At least four. At least four, right? At least four. Just for I, this verse. Huh? I know. I know. It's so much. This really shows us the emphasis of union with Christ. And everyone, this is our fundamental assurance. The fact that we are in union with Messiah, with the Messiah, God's son. Okay, let's finish up here. We're a little bit behind. Let's finish up here. Let's go into the last highly debated passage. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, okay? And so here, again, we have, just to highlight, you have the source. The source of this salvation is grace. It's because of God's grace, which he has given to us in Christ, again, before the foundation of the world. And so the object of this, of this grace is, is the Ephesian believers. They have been saved, the action. And there is this means. We have to receive it the way in time and space that we are brought into union with Christ is by faith. Okay. So, so this is what I'm trying to get at is that although we've been accessing the work of God before this, when it comes to our actual receiving of the benefits, we have to cling to Jesus in faith. So no one, so no one can be saved without faith. I, I want us to be clear. Our, our gospel message is salvation. By grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. And so this is the instrument. But if ever you were to be tempted to think that faith, that there's a grounds of boasting, this could be a ground of boasting. And, and if you've been in the church long enough, if you've been in the church long enough, you know that that's true. You know that it's true. People will use that as a ground for boasting. I have more faith. I've done more, more this or more that. Looking here at this next phrase, you have this word, this. And this is not your own doing. So the question then is, literally, this is, uh, this is from you. And so we can talk here about this being a source. This is not from you. It is the gift of God. So we have a, a clear, uh, we could say this is a clarification. Number one. So people will debate what the this is connected to. And so what we want to say is this is connected to this whole statement, by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not from you. People will want to attach the this just to the faith. And there is some examples for that. I've gone back and forth. Uh, you know, it's very possible that the, this is just connected to the, the faith part. Um, there is some grammatical difficulties with that, though it's not impossible. And so... Um, 
uh, we'll take the more conservative interpretation. Although I do believe strongly that faith as a source does not come from us. If we take this more conservative, careful conclusion here, we would say that the grace, the act, and the faith is not your doing. Does that make sense? And so if we're looking at it in this sense, faith is not an action here. Yes, Pastor Tim, because some other people will think that uh, if you define faith in in grammar, is faith is an action word, right? It's, it's yeah. a verb. So others think that this is a, a, a part, a man's part of salvation and yeah. action. So, yeah. so, so what I'm trying to say, though, is when I say it's not an action, what I'm saying is that it's man is not we are clinging in faith, but it's, but, but the, um, the, uh, it's not coming from ourselves is what I'm trying to say. Let me, let me uh, just, I let, think let, it's, you, it, it's an action from your end, but still that faith was given to us, right, Tim? Yes, exactly. No, you're exactly right. It's our men, but let's, let me just clarify this here. Let, let me clarify just to be clear. Faith is a mental action whose source is not from us. It is a gift. Yeah, sir. Uh, my question, sir, is uh, a person that being saved uh, what comes first? We have faith or we have the knowledge of God? Yeah, so, so, so what comes first is the Spirit, the Spirit opening the eyes, the, the supernatural work of the Spirit. And so they have the, first knowledge. Uh, because this is given, right? So it is this, yeah. because it's coming, it's given. So they have first the knowledge yeah. Yeah. before so, they have the faith. Yeah, so let's just be clear though. Let's be clear though. When I'm saying, I, the knowledge of God as defined in Ephesians, it's the prayer that we would be filled with the knowledge of God. So if you're defining knowledge of God as, as the additional knowledge about God and his will, that comes later. Okay, that's the prayer. But if you're talking about coming to a, a, a knowledge, a, a, a knowing of, of who God is and what he's calling in, in that fu most fundamental sense, that must come first. That's the opening of the eyes so that you see God for who he's. And if you're saying that, that type of knowledge, then yes, that must come because then the reaction of that knowledge, that seeing of the eyes, the hearing of the ears, the, 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 see, the, 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 the changing of the heart, after that, then we cling in faith. We just want to be so careful. I'm sorry. We just want to be so careful with our terminology just because it be, sometimes it becomes confusing and there's, there's overlap here. And so... Um, yeah, it's a great question. We, um, excellent question. So we have to understand and know who God is before we can have, we can cling in faith. Once we see him for who he is, our, it's in our nature. We're just going to cling to him in faith. So I think that's the reason that we need to share or we need to, 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 to preach, right? Yeah, exactly. So because that, it's, yeah. it's, the, it, it's, it's the, the, the God works through his mm -hmm. word. Yes. And the spirit in the heart. And so that's why that's why we have to, to preach the gospel. And that's why Paul, Paul's perspective was he went and tried to convince everyone. He 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 preached the gospel to everyone, Jew and Gentile. He he reasoned with everyone. He wanted them to share because it was through the, the speaking of the word that the spirit convicts the heart. And so that that speaking of the word is so fundamental. So this is where we have to distinguish between means, instruments sources and then ultimately who is behind everything okay and so that's why that's why when we're talking about faith being an action if you're using it as like a work we would say no it's not an action like a work um we have to we have to do it but the source behind that mental action is god himself otherwise there is a form of boasting is is, is everyone tracking there with me okay so
look here now. We have one clarification. This is not your own doing. Clarification number two. It is a gift of God. Clarification number three. Not the result of works. Or we could say here, we could say here, human effort. So the purpose behind this, the purpose behind this is that no one may boast. If we say that faith comes from ourselves as an action, it's our part in salvation. If we say that it's coming from ourselves, it's our part in salvation. Is there, is there a ground of boasting? Yeah, there is a round of boasting if, yeah. if we say we've put faith. Yeah. I believe it is God who who put faith in us through his yeah. word, hearing yeah. from the word. So it yeah. is his work. Yeah. It is his work. And and so so Paul will describe that I worked harder than everyone else, but it wasn't me working. It was the spirit energizing me like, like a battery. And so we want to say is that God puts the battery in us so that we can exercise mental faith. And so you would never take credit. You would never take credit. It's like the okay. iPad. It's like the yeah. iPad. The iPad has the battery. And so the iPad doesn't take credit for its function. I can just unplug it and it'll die. And there's nothing it can do. There's no boasting in the iPad. <laughs> Go ahead, Bray. Yeah, well, the, the ground for boasting is really on giving credit to God. But from our end, there should not be any boasting from yeah. us. And so coming back up here, the connection between this is, this is an explanation. Coming back up to here. And so the, the, the accent is on grace. God has done everything for us. Now look here, and this is where we're going to go back into this strong, the strong predestination, the strong work of God. Look at this. We have another reason here. What is this description? Who are we? For we are his workmanship. We could say creation. We are his new creation. And look at this. Look at the purpose of why he's created. Look at the purpose here. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So prior to, we're, we're, we're in the sphere of dead, deadness, the sphere of sin and trespasses. Now God's new work, making us alive, making us new creatures. Our, our purpose now is for good works. And look at this again, which God had predestined. And look at this, the final, the final purpose. That we should walk in them. So we walked before the prince of the power of the air, the world lifestyle. Now God has recreated us anew. And the goal of our salvation is good works. This is not for ourselves. Here's something else to think about. Without God doing a supernatural work, no one's going to choose God, number one. And number two, no one's going to do good works. This is the offer every day. This is the offer every day. No, no one at the end of the day is worshiping God. That is a hard pill to swallow. You cannot reason with the people. You cannot reason with them. You even think about reasoning with people. There are people, I'm thinking of someone in my mind. You cannot reason with them. It was like, there's nothing you can do. All I could do is pray that God would open his eyes. God has to do a work. This is the supernatural condition. And when you're reasoning with someone and they're listening to you, that's because God is working. That's because God is working. When you're reasoning with someone and they're listening to you and they're interested, that's because the spirit is, is working through you and the word of God to do the work in their life. The three examples, the three, three other examples here, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to close on this. The description is spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness. We see in Ephesians dead. 
So these are different, these are different descriptions of man, mankind's heart. Spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness, dead. And then number four um, is uh, a heart of stone. Now, I want to ask a question to you. Can a blind person ever see? No. No. Can a deaf person ever hear? No. Can a dead person ever walk? No. No. Can someone with a heart of stone, can a heart of stone beat? No, it's stone. It's not 1% chance. It's not 0.5% chance. 0% chance. Without God's supernatural work of granting eyesight, granting hearing, giving life, or changing that heart of stone to a heart of flesh, this will never happen. So the spiritual condition is not weakness. It's not, I can still understand. I just need to be led in the right way. It's deadness deafness, blindness, and a heart of stone. And so when it comes to apologetics, when it comes to gospel, we share the good news. We try to reason with them, but don't leave frustrated because what you're doing is you're, 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 you're speaking the word and, and, and God will use that word to change that person's life but it has to be God's work. You can, never, you can never convince someone to be saved. You can never do it. You will never do it. Never, not in a million years. And if you think you can, I will pray for your soul. I will pray for your soul if you think that you can convince someone to be saved. All that you will do is you will, you will make someone twice the, the, the child of Satan because they will have this, they will be motivated by something in their heart pride, selfishness, ambition, and they won't be a true convert, and now they're in the church. Only the work of the Spirit can change a blind man, and that was Christ's whole ministry, right? The blind, the deaf, the lame, those were all physical types. Going back to biblical theology, they were physical types teaching us spiritual truths, and for us to miss that, in the gospel, Sion Pelagon. And so the message tonight, the gospel, is God's supernatural power to raise us to new life, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And he has predetermined that we would live a life of good works. 